here. I, the Q and A, you want me to do it at the end of cases? Like when do you want me to start asking? Oh, you'll be, be right after me. Okay. We're just going to wait for some more participants to join us. It looks like we have about 300 on board already, and uh, we actually have about 700 of you that registered. So we'll just give a few more, a minute, a minute or two to get people to register. So thank you all for joining us. While we're waiting, maybe we can get uh, George or or, uh, or Jeb to tell us a joke. Or anybody, any of our panelists, anybody have a joke you can kind of share while we're we're getting our attendees uh, logged in here? Sebastian. So actually, Sebastian's in clinic right now. Maybe while we're uh, we're people are logging in, you can tell us. Uh, how you're, how you're running saw, your clinic. I saw a good joke today. Okay, uh, Ed, Ed's patient on board. is calling into coronavirus hotline and says, uh, um, doctor, I don't know what to do. My plants are speaking to me at my house. And <laughs> there, uh, the response from the coronavirus hotline is like, well, as long as, you're, as long as you're not speaking to your plants, you're good to go. So when the plants, when you start speaking to them, then you call us. So... <laughs> okay. thanks for sharing that Ed. thank you uh let's get uh sebastian where are you are you still there sebastian just unmute, unmute yourself if you're still there because sebastian's actually in clinic we we're going to ask him about what he's uh what he's doing but i guess he's busy uh typing something away well i think we'll i think we'll get started uh i think we see we have about uh just about 365 who have been on board, I think is coming in here. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, we've, we've done these rounds in the past and many of you expressed interest in, uh, in joining us. So we have a pretty uh, large group of you here. Um, so I wanna thank you. We have uh, three, I think, interesting cases that'll, that'll uh, bring out some important topics in medicine. And this is uh, of course our best way to keep in touch. The, uh, the COVID-19 has touched all of us, of course, uh, hopefully all of you indirectly, I should say but it's impacted our lives significantly. And, um, and these are great ways for us to keep in touch. Um, we have a real um, a large group of uh, attendees. So uh, we will certainly take Q&A. And, and for those of you who have not used Zoom before, um, if you click on the Q&A button, uh, you'll have the opportunity to type in questions. And Jeb Ong, who will be on board in a second, uh, will be able to take the questions and ask some of our, uh, of our group and some of our um, speakers. Um, and that's the Q&A button. The chat button is not gonna be as useful here, so just use the Q&A button only. Uh, it'll be difficult, of course, for people to actually um, uh, speak up and, and be part of the conversation just because we have so many people here. But to an, encourage an interaction, we, ha we have three panelists uh, that will be part of each case. Uh, and so um, we'll be able to get uh, their expert opinion in there as well. And we'll introduce them as we go along with this all as well. So hopefully you guys are all clear with that. Sorry, I shouldn't trip up. My name is Ike Ahmed. I'm, I'm sitting in my home in, in the west part of Toronto, Mississauga. And I hope all of you are, are safe and protected. Uh, may God bless you all and keep you safe. And uh, let's get over this uh, pandemic, hopefully soon enough as well. Um, let me hand it over to uh, Jeb. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get J Dr. Jeb Ong. And Jeb Ong has uh, been helping to coordinate these rounds. Uh, Jeb, if you can share your slide. Uh, because we did want to encourage um, uh, all of you to, uh, to join and present cases. So Jeb, I'm going to ask you to share. I don't think you're sharing yet, but when you do, please do that. Um, 
Uh, these kind of these cases and these opportunities are, are a chance for you to be able to uh, present an interesting case uh, or speak on a, on a topic or uh, present a paper uh, that may be of interest. So I'll let Jeb uh, maybe just take over for the next couple of minutes just to talk about uh, how this works. So go ahead, Jeb. Okay, so I think at this point we've kind of reached out to quite a few people and we have introduced our, uh, our PRISM I rounds here. Essentially the point is to really kind of continue education, continue teaching uh, during these uh, trying times. Um, just to show you guys, I've already kind of sent this to a few people, especially the presenters who have already accepted to, uh, to speak today. But essentially this is going through the different type of presentation formats that we're looking for. So either you can do a lecture, do a case presentation, which is a lot of what we'll be doing today. If you think there's an interesting article that you want to review and you want to talk about and discuss with the group, that'd be great as well. We'll get into that. Um, so any, any type of questions you have, any comments, if you have a case, bring it up to me, send me an email. I'm going to leave this up for a little bit here so that you have access to that. Um, also, another thing is that if you're doing case presentations, you have videos, um, feel free to send them to me beforehand. We can actually upload them. We have a uh, YouTube channel for Prism iRounds. That way it's just better in terms of video uh, quality for people to actually watch. Sometimes the videos get a bit choppy when we're watching it on Zoom, unfortunately. So it'd be kind of nice to have that beforehand. People can watch it just to kind of see what it's about. And then also during the presentation, obviously it'll be shown, okay? So this table is just to show you in terms of the formats, what you're gonna be looking for. Again, if you're gonna reach out to me and you have a case, I'm gonna send you this again so you will have all this information. But just so that the people who are watching and who potentially have an interesting case already have an idea of uh, what uh, we're looking for here, okay? So I'm gonna leave this up and uh, feel free to either take a screenshot or uh, you know, send me an email, okay? Thank you, Jeb, and uh, keep that up there for a second. So again, um, and please, uh, there's Cindy, she's turned the blinds down. Um, I was gonna say that uh, email Jeb if you have an interesting case you wanna share. We, we obviously can't get everybody up here, but uh, already many of you have expressed interest in presenting, so that's great. Uh, we have already 412 uh, of you here on board. So it's a pretty large audience, which, uh, which is amazing. And in the middle of this, we'll take a little poll just to see what everyone's, where everyone's coming from to kind of get a, a bit of a pulse on, on, uh, on where everybody's calling in from. So uh, I think we'll, what we'll do is we'll get started here. Um, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask um, Ed Margolin um, to uh, start. And Ed Margolin is uh, on faculty at the University of Toronto. He's one of our neuro-ophthalmologists, and uh, he will present a case. Joining him is his fellow, Trishal Jiva Patel, uh, who's a neuro-ophthalmology fellow. We have Robert Adam, who's a comprehensive ophthalmologist in Toronto. Um, and we also have Deepa Yoganathan, who is a multi-talented uh, retina specialty uh, and practicing in the U.S., but also um, has a connection to Toronto as well here as, in our group. So um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, ask uh, Ed if you could maybe share your screen, and, uh, yep. and we'll get started. Thank you, Ed, for being here. Thank you so much for um, having me here. This is amazing to have and to speak in front of so many people. Um, can everybody see the screen? Yep. Yeah. That's good. Panels can see my screen. Okay. Great, so I'm going to do something a little you different. To, so uh, you may, may want to go to the presenter of, mode. Sorry, the, the full screen mode on your screen, Ed, if you could, just to... To the full screen? B bottom left. Uh... Oh, I did it on purpose. I'll tell okay. you why. Okay, got it. Got so, it. Uh, yeah, perfect. You, you, you've noticed that. So I'm going to do something different. We're going to fill up the slides as we go on. So the slides will be mostly empty, but we will fill them up together. And in the end, we can, you can save that presentation. You can actually save, I believe, it in Zoom, or we, we can email it to everybody who participated. And um, I was thinking about what to talk about. And um, initially, I had to present an exotic case or an exotic diagnosis, of which we have plenty of in neuro-ophthalmology. But instead, I kind of settled on presenting a case of a patient with something you all, I'm sure, really love seeing and uh, dealing with us, diplopia. So we'll talk a little bit about diplopia. And the whole purpose of the talk today will be to dissect the approach to the patient with diplopia. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. This is the first slide. I'm going to tell you about this man that I actually saw virtually. I've never seen a patient virtually in my life, but this is a patient that I've actually saw virtually on Tuesday. So um, the diagnosis here is a little bit exotic, but we're gonna really mostly talk about the approach. Um, so it's a 48 year old man. He 
woke up back in November. Now, so now we're in, at the end of March, but this was all going on in November. He wakes up and he notices double. And he said the double is oblique. So it's not up and down, not side to side obliquely. And uh, what does he do? Uh, as many of you know, the symptom of diplopia is a, is a scary symptom. So there's different explanations for that, but patients really do not like it when they see double. And especially younger patients get quite scared, especially if they've never noticed double before. So he goes to the emergency room. And um, I want you to all kind of take a little pause and think about what do you think would have happened to him in the emergency room? Because this is pretty much universal, I think, in all emergency rooms, well, pretty much all of them across the world. This is what would have happened to anybody. Um, this is what he had. Um, we're lucky here that we have a tool right now, it's called Connecting Ontario, where we can log in and punch in the patient's health card number and we can see all the tests that were done to them, including the imaging. We can actually view the imaging. So that's actually pretty amazing. So at this point, all I have is a referral that he has a new onset of double vision and so I'm logging into Connecting Ontario to see what happened to this man. So this is what had happened. So he had a CT scan. And in this particular case, the CT scan was not particularly exciting. It was actually normal, but I wanted to see what was the clinical indication that was listed for the CT scan. So as you can see here, it says left cranial nerve four palsy. Again, I want you to pause and think this is probably a typo because I do not think the emergency room doctor would be able to reliably diagnose the fourth nerve palsy, but it gives us gave me a lot of information already that was something's going on with this man, somebody's examined him, and this is what they saw. And then the next test that I saw he had, this was only two days later, he had an MRI scan of the orbits. And again, the results of the MRI were not impressive, it was normal, but it was important for me to see what was the indication for the MRI, as really at this point I have very little information to go on. Um, and the indication here is actually really quite telling. It says here, bilateral multiple cranial nerve palsy with ataxia. So this is what I want you to keep in mind. The indication here is pretty telling. And that was really why I wanted to see. And uh, the last piece of information that I had is this note, the referring doctor jotted this diagram in his note and he documented the extraocular motility limitation. So again, we're not going to be, I'm not going to quiz you about what you think it is, but just kind of briefly glance at it and see if you can kind of make sense out of it. Um, I couldn't. It's really kind of hard to tell. So there's, you can see that there's diffuse limitation of fracular motility in all direction of gaze. That's what you see. And this is the, the, the referral says rule out CPEO. So you now all heard about the case and uh, we will leave the case for the, for the chunk of this time allotted to me. And we're gonna talk about the approach, our approach to the patient with diplopia. And in the end, we'll get back to that. So I will start uh, engaging our, our moderators. And the first, of course, whenever we're approaching patient with anything, with any problem, we're obviously are going to be collecting their history, which is the part that really lends itself to telemedicine. So the history in diplopia is obviously important and various studies show that just by history you can come up with an answer in approximately 70 to 80 percent of the time. So I will ask our panelists or moderators, what do you think, what is an important thing to obtain on history? What is actually number one thing you would want to obtain on history if somebody was double vision? I would ask them if their double vision goes away when they cover one eye. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Monocular versus binocular. So this is really, really, really number one thing. And you cannot possibly imagine how many patients receive a very, very thorough workup with exposure to a lot of radiation for monocular diplopia. So monocular diplopia is obviously diplopia that persists when one eye is covered. And um, a little sort of wrinkle on the side, People can have both monocular and binocular diplopia, but for the most part, if somebody has diplopia that does not go away, when they cover one eye, 
you can be pretty sure that it is monocular diplopia. And here's my little hint. I'm going to sort of intersperse little, little things, the little pearls that I use in my practice. I use the mnemonic of four C's, four C's that can cause monocular diplopia. And that will be something cornea, so any corneal problem, most likely, most commonly keratoconus, um, cornea, uh, cataract, probably would be really the most common one. And I have to say, I've been amazed that sometimes the cataract is really quite mild, but the patient is really quite disabled from the monocular diplopia. So that would really, in my mind, qualify as a very good indication for cataract surgery. So cataract, um, very, now we'll put the next one. Um, this is really not politically correct, but crazy. So <laughs> functional diplopia is exceedingly common. So we have to keep it in mind. So crazy is another C. And the lastly, something that really almost never happens, and I'll make it in a very, very small font here, very, very rarely diplopia can be due to the cerebral problem. So it could be a polyopsia. Um, so it could be, and it almost always causes homonymous defects. So if you do visual field defect, you can rule that out. So once we've decided that the diplopia is definitely binocular, so it does disappear when the patient covers one eye, what are we gonna do next? What's the next most important thing to do? Anybody has any suggestions, ideas? Um, Regarding the monocular uh, diplopia, do you not feel that a retinal examination is indicated as well? Yeah. Um, excellent question. So you could, put, uh, you could make it five C's and put cones. Right. Put some cones for your fifth C. Epiretinal membrane can produce monocular diplopia. That has been debated by some people that it's really not diplopia, but distortion. But yes, I believe retinal exam is important because sometimes it is difficult for us to get a very clear history. Is this really distortion or is this really diplopia? That so was the one comment I wanted to make, which is that everyone knows who practices clinically that unfortunately, at least half these patients do not walk in saying, I have double vision. They say, things are hazy, things are fuzzy, my eyes aren't working, the world is tilted, right? There's all sorts of ways that they describe it to us and sometimes the biggest challenge, especially in a, in a multicultural city like Toronto, where people have different uh, different languages and different ways to describe things, is to actually narrow down the complaint to being diplopia. So, um, completely also, agree. Also, Ed and and Rob, um, the word distortion. Let's say I ask twenty patients a day, do they have distortion? I would say half of the patients don't know what distortion means. What does it mean? I think double vision is an easier way to. To, an easier word to use to describe distortion. Agree, but some people wouldn't know what double vision is either. So <laughs> moving on, so what is the next thing, what is the next most important thing you would want to ask on history? I would think most importantly, you would want to ask about neurological symptoms associated with double vision or binocular development. Okay. This is amazing. So this is really the next second most important thing you want to know. Now, uh, I will preface it by saying that um, most of these patients will not appear in our offices. They will be in emergency rooms because they will be really unwell. But occasionally you will see a patient who walks in your office and definitely you'll see when you're on call that somebody who has diplopia with associated neurological symptoms, particularly what we call brain stem symptoms. So patients, these are the patients you cannot afford to miss. So these are the patients who have an acute brain stem event. So anybody who has acute onset of double vision, acute onset of double vision, plus they have associated brain stem symptoms, which will be um, any kind of list, attack. See, I'm gonna be keep, I'm gonna keep listing them here. Aphasia, dysarthria, yeah. crossed motor or sensory signs. And that means, remember, the brain stem hosts host three nuclei that are important for us. The nuclear for the third, fourth, and the sixth nerves. Plus, it hosts this very important pathways connecting the middle ear to the ocular motor nucleus, the vestibular ocular pathway. And if this pathway is interrupted, and this pathway is quite long, and it actually goes from the midbrain all the way to the medulla. So if this pathway is interrupted, one eye will become a little higher than the other. 
and patients will be exquisitely sensitive to that. So people will notice uh, vertical diplopia, so it's a skew deviation. So palsy of the third, fourth, or sixth cranial nerves because of the nuclear involvement in the brainstem plus a skew deviation. So that's really the second most important thing to ask these patients in history. Do they have any associated neurological symptoms? And um, uh, let's add more, vertigo, hearing loss, facial numbness, um, motor weakness, etc. And if you hear any of those things, what is the next thing to do? And the next thing to do is very simple. These patients have to be shipped to the emergency room. Like their, their place is not in your offices. They should be immediately be sent out. So these are the two really most important things we want to know. First is monocular or binocular. And if it's binocular, you want to really find these people who really need immediate attention. So anybody who has associated neurological symptoms, particularly these brainstem symptoms that we've, we've put up there. Um, anything else you would want to know? They have diabetes. Um, so obviously we'll want to highlight the full history, their past medical history. Um, anyway, any reason to, Deepa, you specifically ask about diabetes? Because I'm a retina specialist. So you want to know if they have any microvascular risk factors, you will collect a full medical history. And yes. again, we'll, uh, well, basically to narrow to down of, if right. this is something that will resolve itself or is this something that needs further workup? So I would want to know their age and their um, comorbidities that would contribute. You will collect the full medical history. Obviously, as always, we're going to try to concentrate on really, really, really high stake things um, here. I would think also to do... Binocular. Yeah, Trish? To differentiate between vertical and horizontal? Vertical and horizontal is useful, not always, but sometimes it is. Sometimes people can really not tell or sometimes they say it's really oblique, but that, that is useful. Uh, and then the other three things that I'll put up there that we ask of every patient who has double vision, we will ask them the symptoms of this. Giant cell arteritis. Intracranial pressure, excellent. Giant cell arteritis. If they are over 60. Anything else? Myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis. So these are the three things. So everybody with diplopia is going to be asked these questions. Do they have any symptoms of increased ICP, giant cell arteritis, myasthenia gravis? So remember that, vertical, horizontal. And so really the questions for myasthenia will obviously include everything. And of course, you're going to ask them about past medical history. Very important. What do we want to know? Diabetes, anything else? We really want to know if they have cancer. This is very important. Anybody who has a history of cancer will really want to make sure that any new symptoms that they have is not related to cancer, et cetera. You want to know their history, the history of their medications, because all of this can play a role. But these are the most important things. So once we've done the history, and again, we said most important thing will be monocular versus binocular. We want to make sure that we capture everybody who has any associated neurological symptoms. And we want to know the symptoms of increased ICP, giant cell arteritis, myasthenia gravis. Once Just we've not. done that, we're going to move on to the exam. Um, now, in the exam portion, let's see. So we're going to remove that slide. So in the exam portion, one in there. We're going to, I'm going, let's quickly recap the anatomy. What's important? What's the important anatomy here? What is the important algorithm that we're going to use? So in order for us to look anywhere, up or down or left or right, uh, we need to have an intact substrate in the cortex, which the cortex provides the substrate for voluntary gaze movement. And from there, everything will pass through the thalamus, which is our relay station in the, in the rhombencephalon, right above the midbrain. And from the thalamus, everything, the information will pass down to the nuclei of third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerves. And there will be input from the vestibular ocular pathway. And on top of it, two cranial nerves will speak to each other. So connections between 
six and the third, so-called through the medial longitudinal fasciculus. And then after the fascicles of the nerves leave the brain stem, they will all travel and bunch up together and come together in which location? Cavernous sinus. come together in a cavernous sinus. And from there, they will proceed to the superior orbital fissure. Now, we need to remember that this pathway doesn't stop there. These impulses, in order for us to really look anywhere, we need to have intact what? We need to have neuromuscular junction has to be intact. And then the muscle itself has to be intact. So remember, this is the algorithm that we'll be working on. So this is all supranuclear because it is above the oculomotor nuclear in the brain stem and everything else down the road, the infranuclear. So let's keep that in mind. So once to, before we go in and perform the exam. So we reviewed the anatomy right now and we're gonna move on to the next thing. So um, in, on, during the exam, what, would you, what are you normally doing when you're examining patients with diplopia? Check their range of motion. You wanna check their motility. So you wanna check their motility and you wanna do it how? Quickly or slowly? <laughs> you wanna do it slowly and you, would you wanna do it one eye, one eye at a time or both eyes together? We want to do both, but so ductions and versions. So ductions is one, one eye at a time, versions, both eyes together. So you want to check both. And we're doing that in order to what? What are we trying to come up with? What kind of answer we're we trying to get there? We want to know, can we isolate motility deficit to one cranial nerve palsy or not? So this is really the key thing that we want to answer. Can we tell after, the, after looking at extraocular motility whether or not this is involving, we can tell whether or not this is a cranial nerve three, four, or six palsy or we can't. So let's leave it at I mean, there's different approaches to that. And you can, you, I'm sure you're taking, you already have an approach that you've developed over the years in your practice, but this is what I do. So I try to see if that we can say that this is one cranial nerve policy or not. And let's say you're able to tell, yes, this is cranial nerve three policy. What right. are we gonna do with everybody that's cranial nerve three policy? There's only one answer. I just think it's important. Um... Why do we need to do that? We need to make sure that there is no aneurysm pressing on the third nerve, specifically at the junction of posterior communicating artery and internal carotid artery. So everybody needs to get a CTA. That's really, there's no question about it. We're not using the previous formula that we were do it in the past. We're trying to differentiate as a pupil are sparing, pupil are involving. CTA is widely available, and the um, the stakes of losing, of missing, an aneurysmal compressions are too too high. So everybody should receive a CTA. And if your suspicion for an aneurysmal compression is high, you should really ship this patient immediately to the tertiary care center because CTAs can be really tricky to read. So remember, and it really, the interpretation depends on the skill of your neuroradiologist. So the third nerves are easy. If you're able to identify it, now partial thirds can be difficult to identify on the exam, but once you've identified it, it's easy to know what to do. The fourth nerve policy, again, you have to remember the three steps rule, three step rule. Anybody remember that? Hyper deviation. Worse in opposite. Yeah, Remember that? Yeah. Worse mm -hmm. It's worse, worse with head turn and head tilt to the side of the high eye. Better on opposite tilt. 
So it really has to fulfill the three-step rule. And once you've identified that, this is a kind of new information that I'm going to give you today. So remember, most, most patients with fourth nerve palsies are not particularly urgent. And most of them will be, many of them will be decompensated congenital in nature and there isn't anything to be done or it could be ischemic in nature. And again, there is nothing to be done, but we obviously do not want to miss very, very rare tumorous or compressive fourth nerve palsy. So this is the rule. We're going to check the hyper deviation in up and down gaze. And we are going to care only about patients in whom hyper is worse in down gaze. These are the patients who, there was a study done, very well done study that looked at patients who had um, various kind of ideologies for fourth nerve policies. And they found that everybody who had a, an important fourth nerve policy, in other words, the fourth nerve policy that was caused by compression or compression by tumor or by an infiltrative process, all of those patients, the hyperdeviation was worse in down gaze. Uh, different explanations for that, but um, nobody knows exactly why. Presumably, it's because the patients who have congenital decompensated fourth, they have a hyperaction of the, of the inferior oblique, and therefore their hyperdeviation is worse um, in up gaze. So that's really only thing you want to know about the fourth nerve palsy. You want to check the hyperdeviation in up and down gaze, and if it's worse in the down gaze, in case you want to deal, you do want to deal with that. Now, six nerve policies. Let's see how we're doing this time. Um, the six nerve policies. There obviously are plentiful, and I'm sure most of you have seen one in the last months or so. Um, this is a little hard. There's no exact consensus here. Some people image everybody. Some people wait for a couple of months and then image of people, and the patient doesn't get better. This is what we do. Um, if patient is older, and we will define it, no offense to people in the audience, arbitrarily 50 years of age or older. Patients 50 or older and have microischemic risk factors, we can wait. This is what we wait. Some people do not like to wait and like to image everybody. Uh, should be better or resolved in two to three months. If not, image and have to get an MRI. Uh, CT scan will not be adequate for that. So this is what we do with the six nerve policy. So we spoke about our approach to diplopia. Let's again, take a step back. What did Ed, we say? We said- Ed, can, you, can yeah. you clarify what kind of MRI? Do we need MRI with gatto? Um, so ideally you would really want to get gadolinium and you ideally want to get something called steady state um, gradient echo images. This will allow, these are particular sequences that are designed for looking at the cranial nerves. Um, they suppress the surrounding tissue and it really allows you to see this very tiny nerve in its entire course. Uh, but again, your neuroradiologist should know about that, of course. So third, so we said we're gonna look for patients of monocular diplopia with those without, those people don't need other investigation other than a good ophthalmological examination. We're going to find all the patients have neuro associated neurological symptoms and ship those to emergency room. We're gonna ask them for symptoms of GCA, increased intracranial pressure, and um, symptoms of um, uh, increased GCA, symptoms of increased intracranial pressure, and uh, we're gonna identify all of those patients. And then we will, and myasthenia, of course, and then we will move on to the exam. And before we will move on to the exam, you will remember this little, um, little algorithm, that little uh, anatomical algorithm that we went through. And then when you're examining the patient, you will try to, the question that you will try to answer is this, could you tell that this is an isolated cranial nerve palsy? And we said what to do with those patients. And if it's more than one cranial nerve palsy, remember they're together, in really only two locations, which is the cavernous sinus and superior orbital fissure. So obviously anybody who has more than one cranial nerve palsy definitely requires urgent neuroimaging. And that would include MRI brain orbits 
with contrast, and you would want to indicate these particular areas that you would want the radiologist to look at. Um, this is more than one cranial nerve palsy. Now, sometimes when you examine the patient and uh, you notice that it's really, you can't tell whether it's a one or two cranial nerve palsies, but you notice that they really cannot look all the way up, all the way down, all the way to the, all the, way to the left. And here we're going to think of these entities, chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. Now, the thing about that is usually do not see double because usually it's very symmetric. Now, what to do if nothing makes sense? <laughs> We're gonna come back to our patient here. Because remember, when you look at our patient, you look at these recordings, it's kind of like neither here or there. You can't really tell is this one cranial nerve palsy, maybe, perhaps, maybe it's a third and a sixth, but really, really difficult to tell. Um, so what to do when you really cannot tell them apart? And so now we're gonna get into this really rare thing that cause diplopia. So remember, we've looked whether or not it's a third, fourth, or sixth. Um, now, actually, before we move on to that, let me just add one more slide and tell this, I think it's a very useful table, what to do if somebody has vertical diplopia, but you still are not entirely sure whether or not it's an isolated cranial nerve or something else is going on. There's five things only that can cause vertical diplopia. And um, anybody, Rob, any, you want to volunteer? Five things sure. that can cause vertical diplopia? Sure. Um, myasthenia. Okay. Third nerve and fourth nerve, you've already listed. Yep. Thyroid eye disease. So orbital process. And trauma. Deviation. Deviation. So on, on that note, before you, before you take over, I've just been watching some questions coming up on the chat board, Ed. There have been some good questions. So one yep. question that came up was acute third nerve pupil sparing. Is that an emergency to send straight to the emergency room for CTA? Yeah. Or can that be referred? Yes, yes. Let's just leave it at that. The answer is very simple. Yes, everybody gets a third nerve, goes to the scanner. No other, no other deliberations here. Very easy. Uh, okay. And then okay. a couple other points that I saw come up that were repeated a few times was on history, just specifically asking about head trauma, which can, can point you towards a fourth. Um, okay. It's an important question to ask. And then now, of course, if it uh, is a traumatic fourth nerve palsy, what are you going to do for these patients? Tr Treatment-wise? You're going to fit them with prisons, so you're going to bring them back. So not a, yeah, not a really biggie to miss. Uh, right. Not a biggie to miss, yes. But we can add it to the history. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that those questions came up a few times. And then a few times yeah, also what know. came up was on history, history of thyroid disease, history of MS specifically. Uh, history of yeah. MS is, is interesting. Okay. I don't want to, I want us to move on to our case, but how would a mess cause double vision? Um, anybody can quickly tell? An MLF lesion. I know. So intranuclear ophthalmoplegia, that's right, that was one reason. Excellent. And it can cause abnormalities in the brainstem. It involves nuclear or fascicles in the brainstem because that is the only place where the ocular motor nerves are myelinated is in the brainstem. When, once they leave the brainstem, they lose the myelination. So really the multiple sclerosis becomes irrelevant. But I'm getting, I'm getting a text that we should be wrapping up in a few minutes. So let's move on um, to the, <laughs> uh, pay attention. So what to do when it doesn't make sense. And here I wrote stuff down because here we're dealing with really kind of unusual stuff. Now when stuff doesn't make sense, the first thing you wanna think about is definitely neuromuscular junction because myasthenia can mimic everything and that's what should be going through your mind when things do not make sense. I put other things there because it's not only myasthenia that can cause neuromuscular junction disorder. Um, there are other rare things such as botulism, Lambert, Eaton, and there are other rare manifestation of these things, but uh, we're just gonna keep it simple for now. So that's number one. Number two is, remember cranial nerves are a structure in and of itself and various processes can involve cranial nerves. So uh, in various, the processes really can vary greatly, but the most common one will be an inflammatory process 
called Guillain-Barré syndrome and the variant of Guillain-Barré syndrome. And Guillain-Barré syndrome, um, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, um, so let's keep it here. So inflammatory process involving the cranial nerves. And then the third thing is, um, again, this is rare, but you've got to keep it in mind, especially when you're on call and you're asking to see somebody uh, in an emergency room or an ICU who has really weird extraocular motility pattern. You've got to think of Wernicke encephalopathy. A Wernicke affects the cranial nerves um, in, the, in the brain stem and can produce very odd motility disturbance pattern. And it, it is obviously very treatable thing, so you want to think about that. So anybody, and, and the key thing is this word, encephalopathy. Usually these patients are a little bit encephalopathic, sometimes a lot encephalopathic. Um, we want to not forget, obviously, an orbital process. Thyroid eye disease is very common, and that can obviously produce double vision. I didn't put it in the top here because all these, all these processes, for instance, thyroid eye disease, is very, very characteristic clinical findings associated with that. So you've got to look for a presence of um, um, a lid lag, retraction, proptosis, et cetera. And then really very rare things, such as sarcoid, vasculitis, this newly described entity called IgG4 disease, lymphomas, various perineoplastic entities can, ex can really affect any of the cranial nerves that we spoke about. And the thing about that is that oftentimes it produces a very, very odd extraocular motility pattern because sometimes more than one cranial nerve is involved and sometimes, <clears throat> and sometimes uh, it can be sort of symmetric but not truly symmetric. So again, this is what to think of when things do not make sense. And I think we've captured most things, but we'll see if people have any other comments to add here. And finally, we're going to go back to our case because we're going to be wrapping up here. Um, this is what I thought that our patient had. This is a diagnosis I've deduced because I've actually, on Tuesday when I spoke to him, I asked his wife to show me his, his, uh, his face and I asked him to look up and down, right and left. And his extraocular motility was completely normal. So now we see that he went from this really quite interesting restriction, which was kind of fairly symmetric in a null direction of gaze. And we saw that he also had associated ataxia going along with that, which has completely resolved in approximately six months. So I deduce that this is what like, that he most likely had that, the miller facial variant of Guillain-Barre. And Guillain-Barre syndrome, it's an acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. And again, don't wanna to go too much into that because this is really a zebra and uh, really not super important, but you've gotta just know a little bit about it. So Guillain-Barre syndrome, and I'm sure you've heard of patients and seen patients who've had it, um, but there's a whole lecture on it in and of itself that can involve motor function, it can involve sensory function, and we divide it essentially into three components. The first is when it's really mostly, you, you have demyelinating antibodies, which were not identified yet. So you get demyelination, mostly of peripheral nerves. Uh, and these are the patients that have difficulties moving and can end up on ventilators sometimes. And then you get a subset of patients who have antibodies against something called gangliosides. And gangliosides are these, it's a carbohydrate receptors and they're present in, these, uh, in this uh, neuromuscular junction. So here, presumably in Guillain-Barre syndrome, you get, you get an antibody, there are particular antibodies here, GQ1B, that are directed against the neuromuscular junction of these extraocular Extra, extraocular nerves, so third, fourth, and sixth, was their connection to the muscle. So that's why these patients have kind of odd pattern of extraocular motility um, imbalance. And on top of it, they almost always have varying degree of ataxia and various degree of areflexia. Um, and um, the other thing is they almost invariably have high CSF protein. Now, as you saw in our man, he has recovered completely, and that's usually the course of patients with Miller-Fisher variant of Guillain-Barre. Usually they recover almost completely. They do have associated ataxia. That's why I showed you that requisition from the MRI scan. That's why it was important that uh, they mentioned they had multiple cranial nerve palsies with ataxia, and in combination with the fact that he's completely resolved, um, really makes us think that this was the only possibility for him to have. So. Um, Let's see if we have any time for questions. 
Thank you, Ed. Maybe I'll, we'll give our panelists uh, just a couple of uh, minutes just to add any comments or questions. Maybe you've uh, incorporated some of the comments that we've seen in the chat and the Q&A boxes. Uh, and then we'll move on to our next case. We have a glaucoma case and we have a, a cataract anterior segment IOL case as well. Any questions from the, from the moderators, Rob? Deepa? I'm just looking at the list of questions that's been posted on the chat board. Um, yeah, we had a pretty interactive group. I think a lot of them, yeah. uh, a lot of them had the right, uh, had, had the right thoughts and the right questions to ask. So great. Some other points that they made were dermatomyositis and migraine history, um, color vision history. Color vision? And pain, mm. pain or Why pain would a color vision be important? Let's see, why would you think the color vision be important? Deepa, Rob, Trish, anybody can? I think, it's a, I think color vision is not important at all. So color vision really will be a function of an afferent visual pathway. Mm -hmm. So something that goes from the organ to the brain. So from the optic nerve, to the brain and here we're really the, the disorders of extraocular motility the diplopia really will be affecting the efferent system so two different systems so afferent and efferent system so we can skip the color vision um dermatomyositis is a very particular rare disease so we're probably not going to be asking everybody about it but you would ask about past medical history anything but else there's a comment here that i think should be addressed uh someone said you don't get ataxia with brainstem pathology so I think in this particular case, the ataxia was from peripheral nerve involvement of the of the Guillain Barre. So but somebody certainly, mentioned certainly there are. I'm, I'm not the neuroophthalmologist here, but there are motor fibers passing through the brainstem that produce. Well, okay, we're not going to we're not going to delve into the pathophysiology of Guillain Barre and Miller Fisher. That was not the purpose, but it does affect really. It's a peripheral. It's a peripheral neuropathy that in this case affected cranial nerves, which are very similar to peripheral nerves, except they exit the brainstem. So the pathology, you're right, the pathology is not in the brainstem, pathology in the peripheral nerves. And we didn't say that ataxia here was due to the pathology in the brainstem. That was, a correct, that was actually a correct, um, correct comment, but that's right. So the ataxia here was from the peripheral neuropathy. Thank you, Ed. I'm going to move forward here. Thanks so much for sharing uh, that case. Uh, if you didn't have double vision before, you may have it now after that uh, dizzying array <laughs> of, uh, of important pearls. I, even though I'm a glaucoma specialist, we do see neuro cases come to our clinics for different reasons. And in fact, even during the uh, coronavirus um, shutdowns, interestingly enough, we, we get referrals uh, from the emergency department or from patients and family doctors uh, with patients with double vision. Uh, and I think you've given us some good pearls. Uh, I will say probably the most common reason I find is refractive error, uh, and whether it's from a cataract induced or otherwise. And again, usually you can pick it up on a monocular cue. So thank you very much. I'm actually going to take the opportunity to take a poll here. And I'd like to basically launch this poll uh, to all of you. You should be seeing it in front of you. And uh, I'd like you to um, answer here where you are tuning in from. Um, we have uh, people from around the world. We have about uh, 450 of you at one time, which I think is pretty phenomenal. Uh, it's amazing how uh, in some ways this has brought us together. Uh, and while we're together, we must always remember, of course, those that are not uh, able to be with us anymore or those that are struggling and are in ICUs and in hospitals, including a number of ophthalmologists and our colleagues. Uh, just even today, uh, hearing about uh, our colleagues who unfortunately um, are quite sick. And so our thoughts and prayers are with them, but we're blessed to be here together. Um, so it looks like uh, over half of you have, have voted. Um, we have a pretty large con contingent from North America. Uh, and I will just end the poll here just to show you what everyone has voted and I'll share the results here. So it looks like you've got uh, uh, about 57% from North America, second place South America, some, some Europeans with us, Asia, Africa as well. So we're predominantly a North and South America group here as well. Let's, uh, let's move to our next, uh, our next um, question here, which um, is uh, who you are. And if you can start uh, voting here, whether you're a ophthalmologist and if you're a specialist, um, ophthalmologist or an optometrist or resident, medical student, nursing industry, patient or other, uh, please vote. 
Um, again, we've got about 450 of you. It's great to see everybody here. Uh, I do want to thank Ed again. I want to thank our panelists, uh, Deepa, Rob, and Trishal for, for being with us here. And I want to thank uh, George uh, Durr, who's an, our next presenter, and he's put up uh, Jeb's email address, and Jeb will be the one collecting your uh, questions as they come. This is a glaucoma case, and we are admittedly a bit glaucoma and cataract heavy, but we thought we'd start off with something a bit different as well with Ed's presentation. And joining uh, George is, uh, is Hadi Saheb from, and I should mention George from University of Montreal. Uh, we have Hadi Saheb from McGill. We have Cindy Hutnick from University of uh, uh, Ontario, Western Ontario in London. Uh, and we have Nir Shoham, who is coming to us from New Brunswick. So let me just end the poll here just to show where everybody is from. Let's show the results. Looks like we have a majority of, of ophthalmologists. Most are subspecialists. We have some comprehensives. We have some optometrists, residents, and uh, only six medical students. They must be busy working right now. Uh, and some industry as well. No patients. Okay, so we can say we say whatever we, whatever we want now, right? So, um, and I see a lot of friends. I see, I see a lot of friends online too, which is great to see you all as well. I hope you're doing well. Uh, as you can see, I have no time to cut my hair, but that's pretty well the usual case anyways. Um, okay, George, take it away. I want to thank the panelists for being part of it. So thank you, George. All right, thanks, Ike, and thanks to Jeb as well for uh, putting this together. It's really a uh, great idea in these times where we're uh, trying to all stay at home and uh, limit uh, our, our contact with each other, uh, but this is a great way to stay connected and uh, keep learning because uh, this is something that we want to continue doing when these times when we have uh, nothing else to talk about but COVID. So let's talk about uh, some glaucoma here. Um, I have a few financial disclosures, none are relevant to this uh, talk. Well, I'm a consultant and I honor him from uh, Allergan. So um, I was referred this case for query progressive glaucoma and drop intolerance. So this is a 69 year old woman. She had bilateral SLT uh, in the past. Uh, she has the thinnish corneas around 500 ish. IOPs have been ranging between 12 and 15 with, by the referring doctor on three different medication classes, had, um, had allergies to Alphagan, uh, good complaints per, as per patient. I mean, she's telling me she's taking it all the time, but the drops are bothering her. She, she hates putting them in. It's, it's uh, quite annoying. She has these mild cataracts with 20-20 vision, and the angles are wide open. So here are her visual fields over the past uh, three years. So unfortunately, I don't have the, the GPA, but I'm just kind of showing you here. Just looking superiorly, we're wondering if the, the, uh, that arcuate is, is getting uh, more dense as uh, the years go by. You see the mean defect kind of going up and up uh, as, uh, as she's potentially progressing at these lowish IOPs. Um, we don't have the GPA on the OCT either, but you know we have this doubts. We have this patient that's having trouble with her drops. Maybe she's progressing superiorly in her left eye. These are her 10-2s in the left and in the right eye. So there's already central um, uh, 10 degree field damage in both eyes. Um, and uh, she, she, she wants something to be done. She's tired of her drops. So what would you do? I'm asking the panel. And while you do that, can you go back to the visual fields, George? Because that, that's obviously why what you're concerned about, I imagine, right? The, yes. The previous one. Yeah. Thank you. I guess I'll, I'll just jump in from the beginning because we mentioned age on the, the last case. 69 years old, in my opinion, is still somewhat young. If we look at um, the average life expectancy in Canada, so what I often tell my patients is okay. you may need your eyes for another 30 years. So I, I think we do have to look at these fields and um, consider that this patient is progressing and that 69 years old is I think relatively young in the lifespan of this patient. Yeah, definitely, that goes into my uh, thinking, of course. Uh, any other thoughts by the other panelists? Maybe, uh, Hattie, what do you think here? Uh, I think to me, something that would be useful to know would be when was the SLT done? Was there any response to the SLT and the extent of the response? The extent yeah. and duration of the response. But you know, yeah, Hattie, so I'm gonna have... stop or ask the other panelists, including George, do we really think SLT has a role here? She's a, a patient who has presumably pressures in the mid-teens. She's um, on maxly tolerated medical therapy. So I'm um, just wondering, do, do people think SLT would have a chance of lowering her pressure? 
I mean, I think so. And looking at the visual fields, I mean, there's no question of progressions on my mind, but I, I would say this is not a slam dunk. You know, the variability is, is quite significant. You know, you go from 14.5 to 11 to 14 to 12 to 15. And as you look at this, this is, yes, suggestive for progression, but I don't think it's a slam dunk. And, um, and so I think that if the response was very limited, then I think we need to, you know, move in another direction. But if the response was significant, then that's something we can do. And also, whenever I hear about intolerance to drops, I always question, you know, the, the reality of intolerance to drops. I think uh, there's, you know, almost a baseline that um, compliance might be limited. And when I actually look at potentially an NTG patient, I would like to know some of the past medical history. So I typically ask them about their blood pressure. Um, I ask the spouse about um, obstructive sleep apnea if they snore. I ask patients about their blood pressure medications as well, if they tend to take it in the morning, if they're taking it, if they take it, tend to take it in the morning versus afternoon or nighttime. And that's potentially another option of, or a patient of doing perhaps IOP monitoring. So a 24 hour or multiple, um, multiple visits. Okay, so those are all excellent points. I'm gonna say, uh, firstly, this SLT was done maybe a couple years ago. Moderate response, I don't have the exact details of how long it lasted, but she only had one try at the SLT. Uh, in terms of her past medical history, she's a healthy 69 year old, she doesn't take any meds. Uh, no questions of sleep apnea. Uh, she uh, she doesn't uh, she doesn't take any hypotensive med medication. So I didn't ask for a 24-hour blood pressure uh, monitoring, although that's on my mind. And with the referring doc, the T maxes were around 18. So uh, this really is like in that spectrum of uh, normal pressure glaucoma range. Now that being said, um, this is always you know taking pressures during the day. There was no 24-hour monitoring. So to Hattie's point of, um, you know, it is SL, will SLT be enough? Um, and uh, if, uh, if uh, and also Sydney's point that to say, hey, you know, this patient is probably progressing. Um, there maybe is, there maybe is fluctuation in this uh, patient's IOP during the day. And this is where uh, some of the uh, extra uh, testing could be important to figure out what's the peak IOP. So, um, and this is where um, and this is where I did a little bit of a, a test that is a bit of an old school test, but that's coming back uh, kind of into into the vogue now with the water drinking test. Basically, the patient drinks two liters of water, um, sorry, one liter of water uh, in five minutes, and then we check pre baseline pressure and pressure every fifteen minutes for an hour. And uh, they're going to think that they're drinking like. You know, no, two gallons of water when they're doing this, they find it's a lot, but they, they, they have to not drink or not eat for two, for two hours prior. So typically, you know, I've done this in, in small-ish small uh, patients that don't have uh, the biggest uh, mass and they can drink that water pretty fast and they haven't had any issues yet. Um, and uh, you can see here her baseline pressures, you know, as, uh, as they always were around 14, 15, and then after 15 minutes, surely enough, they go up to 18, 22 and 26 at 45 minutes. So this is quite um, uh, telling to me. And uh, it's the left eye that's going higher as well. There's a bit of an asymmetry. So this is another you know, important point. You typically find that the eye that you think is gonna get worse, um, that it's on the, um, it's the side that, that the uh, highest peak pressure uh, appears. So water drinking test has been uh, you know, correlated with progression, has been correlated um, with, um, uh, with uh, with uh, the, the peak IOP during the day, um, so this this is kind of quite interesting. Now I don't have the eye care at home or other sort of monitoring at home, but this is a, a nice way to kind of mimic that. George, so, I just, just want to just make a comment because uh, I think when I see these kind of cases, I'm always thinking, okay, is this pro is this true progression or not? Right? I mean, sometimes we see something we think is progression, but maybe variability, and sometimes we actually miss progression. So that's that's the first point, and I think you've hit a lot of the po points here. I think um, the second question is, is uh, you know, are we missing uh, IOP fluctuation or, or spikes? And I think, again, it was probably mentioned, I think some people mentioned on the chat box uh, or the Q&A was about, is this kind of, for example, angle closure? Are we missing angle closure? Because sometimes that can mimic, uh, you know, it looks like an open angle, chronic angle closure, but yet the pressures are spiking up at other times. And there have been a few questions, George, about it, you know, um, checking pressure at different times of the day. 
uh, using home tonometry. I think you kind of addressed that as well. So I think, I think your point is, is, is that if this patient is progressing, at what pressures are they progressing? Are they progressing at, at you know, your mid-teens or are they progressing at higher levels? And what you're implying here is this provocative test of uh, water drinking test is, is implying that their outflow facility is reduced and basically their peak IOP is maybe up at other times. And, um, and that's kind of what you're implying here in terms of, uh, in terms of what your treatment IOP is gonna end up being, your target IOP is gonna be. So can I, I ask on behalf of all of the ophthalmologists listening, so we could do a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, we could do a diurnal tension curve, we can do a water drinking test. In your practices, Ike and George and, and Jeb, do you routinely do all of these tests? Because I think what we're getting at here is how much documentation do you need to justify going to surgery? Because you have a patient who maybe until you do these provocative tests has a pressure of 14, you're putting them at the risks of surgery. Is there enough documentation such that if there is a complication, one can say, well, we know we had to do something. So I guess my question was to you, to you do you do all of the tests? Do you select the tests? Um, how much testing do you do before you offer surgery? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I'll throw it back out to the panel to see what, what do they think. But uh, in, in, in my practice here, it's really difficult to get um, sleep apnea testing. So uh, that's been a real uh, issue to, to, to get those tests uh, done uh, in the hospital. There's up to two years of wait list. So I typically uh, send a note to their family doctor or their, uh, any you know, physician that is taking care of or inter internal medicine specialist to you know, try to coordinate all of that. And if they do have blood pressure medication, I, I really try to send a note to say, hey, can, you, can we change this to the morning? I don't necessarily do it myself. I ask them if they can get that done. Um, and then the 24 hour blood pressure monitoring, that's also in a patient that I, that, that I feel has uh, had blood, blood pressure issues. Because the issue is if, if you do indeed have low, high, low, low pressure at night, low blood pressure at night, what's the treatment? I'm not sure that the, the evidence in, the, uh, in uh, the literature is too good about you know, whether we should take you know, salt tablets or other sort of uh, mediums to, to, to increase blood pressure uh, during the day or during the night. So that's, that's a bit of an issue for me. So I don't know what if others, what, what do others use and what's their practice patterns? Near maybe? So I, I, do, um, I do do blood pressure monitoring. I ask either, so in my current practice, I would be the one actually sending the patient rather than asking them to see their GP. Previous practices, academic centers, I would actually do send them to GPs. And it would just give me another um, factor to calculate in, in terms of ocular perfusion pressure. So I, I do wanna see that it is really a non-IOP related um, factor or it is an IOP related. So um, in an academic center and the residents here would probably hate me, but we would actually hospitalize patients for a 24 hour IOP and blood pressure monitoring um, and actually have residents do their Goldman um, every two, three hours. So that's that's no fun. You can use the home monitoring, the um, iHome um, eye care monitor, although I, I have very conflicting results with that one. But I, I really want to know that it is the nothing else but the pressure um, that causes their, their disease to progress. Because say it is something else and we've done a major procedure and you, if we're thinking of one here, it has to be to reach single digits or, or really low teens. So, and this is a patient with advanced disease within 10 degrees of fixation. So I, do, I don't want to make uh, a mistake here. And I do want to cover all, all my, my spots here. Well, Nir, could I ask you, based upon what George said, say it's endogenous nocturnal systemic hypotension and they're progressing. Would you consider not doing surgery because you think they would progress even if you got into the single digits in terms of eye pressure? So it's a, it's a very good question. It's a very good question. Um, I would try and maybe have them elevate their, their blood pressures. And um, in one way is, is actually do asking them to eat more salty, salty food, um, maybe pickles or, or stuff like that, that will help. Um, uh, increase their salt intake and blood pressure. If they're using blood pressure medications at night, 
um, in um, association or in collaboration with her with her GPs, maybe try and, and alter their blood pressure regimen. Um, and yeah, ultimately this patient would probably need to have something done, uh, whether less invasive or, or more invasive. I think we're very fortunate enough to have something other than a filtration procedure at the moment, George, but, but it is, you know, it is an option. And these patients, so she has been progressing relatively slowly. So it's not like a, a very significant over one year. So we have a follow-up of about four years. Um, so I think we might have, and anyway, she's advanced. So while you will be seeing her every three, four months anyway, um, I, I think there's, time to still do other things and and still be proactive um, with her treatment yeah no i think you're totally right there's uh there's definitely uh some uh we have some time here um but i do think that at this stage um this was my opinion now again i'm curious to see what others would have done but in, in this young patient 69 years old with possible progression peak IOPs that are going into the, the mid twenties, um, you know, what, what surgery would you guys go for? And George, I'll, you I'll bug you. Let, let me bother you for just one second. I'll also ask the patient. So sometimes we get these referrals as kind of t secondary or tertiary care centers. You get a referral for progression. So first of all, I ask the referring physician, send me some fields because when I get one field, it's a snapshot, it's what they look like today. So I always like to see previous fields, but I ask the patient, so why, why have you been referred here? Is, does anything bother you? Because say she does not feel anything, you go and do surgery and then she snuffs out or process fixation, then she doesn't really understand why you did her procedure. So I, I kind of want to make sure that they understand. And to be honest, not nice to say, but for them to feel some vision loss. So, mm -hmm. so they, they, they realize the importance of this. So George, it looks like, like the majority of people, uh, the majority of people don't do water drinking tests. So it's interesting that you use, you're using it here. The majority don't. Um, and is this something you do routinely, George, or, or when do you use it and, and how do you find it valuable? Yeah, good question. So uh, water drinking test, um, it's cheap. So it's pretty easy to do. It's time, it's time uh, uh, it takes a little bit of time in the clinic and it kind of ruins a little bit your workflow. You gotta find a way that you kind of keep a patient in the same room and just come in and out, ask them to monitor their time. So that's one kind of annoying part of it, but it gives me so much information, especially in patients that have, uh, you know, these low-ish IOPs that are maybe query progressing and I'm not, I don't want to keep them for a full day to do the IOP measuring during the day. Uh, I could do that as well, but just keeping them tr doing this provocative testing, of course, if they don't have any heart conditions or, or kidney conditions, this is something that really gives me a lot of valuable information. Sometimes even before starting a treatment, a patient that's coming in for a query, normal pressure glaucoma, uh, pressures are in the you know, mid teens and um, before starting a drop, uh, I'm seeing these OCT changes and, you know, maybe nothing on the field, but the OCTs are starting to show me some, some damage, some early damage. I like to start these uh, provocative testing and, and surely enough, I've found a few that have gone over 20, uh, 25 uh, and, uh, you know, give me a little bit more um, uh, you know, arguments to tell the patient, hey, listen, you know, this is a, this is a reason to do, this is a reason to start treatment, whether it's drops or SLT or so, uh, you know, that's kind of where it's been fitting in my practice so far. George, is it George, your go-to? Let me push you a little case? further and take this case. Positive, uh, provocative test, what would you do? Negative, provocative test, what would you do? And are those things different? Because, of course, all the tests we do, we want to we wanna make sure that they're... <laughs> yeah, how do you got like a little bit of a photobomb there. So yeah, so um, yeah, you're right. Uh, it's important to figure out why you're doing each of these tests. Now, say this patient hadn't had a positive water drinking test. Let's say it had gone to, you know, 16 or 17 only, and uh, there's not really much of a change. I think that would have changed my approach of surgery. Um, if I wanted, now, this is kind of my question to you guys. Uh, what type of surgery would you have done? Like the different type, I, I think this patient personally needs a filter. Now it's a question of which filter. And um, this is where I think that if we're aiming for targets, 
that are consistent in the mid teens, you know, if you stay at 14, 15 throughout the day, then that's where something like an ab, inter uh, ab internal uh, gel stand could be, you know, useful, the Zen gel stand, uh, versus uh, having to do a trabeculectomy and having to aim for the, you know, high single digits or, or low teens um, with the risk of hypotony. Um, th those are kind of the, 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 the pros and the cons that I'm, I'm kind of uh, weighing here. Now, what, what do you guys think about that? George, you did mention that her vision is good, so she's not like visual acuity. So something that I've kind of started, or in the couple of years that um, I've had the micropulse, I have done micropulse on these cases. And if you use the minimum most energy in, in this case, you can definitely reach even single digits or, or really low teens. So if I kind of think of, well, maybe they don't have a cataract yet, and that's maybe an eye that I perhaps rather not get into at the moment. Um, Micropulse seems to be um, effective yet harmless. But that's a good question you asked. She's 69 and still seeing 2020. How many of you would do a combined procedure, whether it's a combined distal outflow blood forming or a, um, just a single solo procedure? If I were to do a any interve ocular intervention, I would take the cataract out as well. Actually, in one of our comments, someone said just performing cataract. I think this is a very high risk patient to perform only FACO on. And if we're assuming she's open angle, uh, that's someone that I would monitor really, really, really closely. And she's on MTMT. So only a cataract here is, is probably not the best idea. So she needs FACO plus. So, so a couple of points there, and we'll, we'll, we'll brush upon them. So the CPC portion, um, the only issue I have with CPC is, yes, you may be able to, to lower the pressure. How, for how long, that's a question mark. And the other issue, too, is if she ends up needing a, a filter down the line, then she's probably at higher risk of getting hypotony afterwards or uh, because of uh, uh, less uh, secretion by the ciliary body. So um, I'm, I, I have a little bit of a you know, apprehension with, uh, with regards to CPC prior to filters. Uh, there's not a lot of evidence out there, but they're starting to, some people are finding these correlations with uh, higher amounts of hypotony uh, after CPC treatments, oh, filters after CPCs. Uh, and then to the cataract portion, uh, that's another, you know, question mark, whether cataracts and a filter uh, decrease the uh, chance of the blood uh, working properly. And uh, so this is a long discussion that I had with the patient. Um, and she, she was seeing quite well. She understood the risk that the cataract may progress later on and we may need to do a cataract surgery in, in a year or two or, or even uh, further down the, down the line. Uh, but she, uh, she kind of declined that and said, uh, I'll, I'll take the risk later on for that the, the blood may, may fail down the road. So I want to just move, around, move along here because uh, we got some more, uh, more things to discuss about this patient. So I ended up doing a Zen. And George, I'm, uh, I'm just going to interrupt you just one second because actually somebody somebody very nicely uploaded a, a, a PDF of a study comparing water drinking test and 24 IOP that was done uh, at APEC in Mexico City. Um, and I guess I'll just, the only comment I make, and you probably haven't seen that yet, is um, that, uh, you know, whenever we, care, whenever we compare water drinking test to 24 hour IOP, we're assuming that we're measuring IOP 24 hours and we're going to pick up fluctuation. And I don't think WDT or watering test is meant to replace or be a surrogate necessarily for 24 hour IOP. I think it's a mistake we make when we think we got to correlate double drinking test to 24 IOP. Uh, this is a provocative test. It's obviously not physiologic, but it's trying to load the patient to provoke the uh, potential IOP spike, which can potentially be where uh, the IOP may be going up and down for different reasons, not just because of diurnal fluctuation. So I would, I would caution that. I think the best evidence we have would be studies that actually look at WDT uh, prospectively to see whether it correlates to those who progress. And although we need more data on this, I think there are some studies that actually are showing this. But I just would caution, because I know, I know I hear this a lot, um, that, uh, that, that we need to correlate it to 24-hour uh, um, IOP. And I realize, of course, that, that I see more comments about guidelines and I think it's true. I mean, we would love to have all the evidence in the world to show it, but uh, even, even guidelines don't tell us how to incorporate all of our diagnostics. And I think it just adds one more thing. Obviously controversial as you hear, as you see here, most people don't use it. I never used it for 15 years 
But in these situations here, I'm going to suggest you strongly think about it because when you're stuck with a patient who's progressing uh, with pressures that are otherwise normal, start thinking about what is truly happening to the IOP at other times. And the best thing is obviously uh, doing uh, an IOP sensor in the eye to know that. We don't have that yet, but we do use our eye care home. I do find that to be potentially helpful or this. And I do think it does help us, but that's again, our, our own experience. So thank you, George, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's great. That's a great point. Uh, so I did the Zen about a month ago. So this is kind of all, all pretty fresh here. Uh, Post-op day one, Seidel positive, pressure of two. So now what I've been doing with the Zens, and this is kind of mimicking a little bit what Ike has been doing recently too, is uh, I've been needling after implanting the Zen uh, ab internally. And of course, at the time of needling, uh, we perfed and um, the conjunctiva. So uh, I was like, okay, this is fine. It's a small perf. Tenons will go over it. Um, I've seen this many times, no problems. Uh, so I decreased the prednisolone, stopped the NSAIDs, started aqueous suppressants, and that failed. So uh, see them again, post-op day four, side down positive, pressure of three, tried to needle to just move the Zen away, you know, push it away, get it to a different spot. And it wasn't moving, so... Um, that failed. Um, what would somebody, what would you guys try to do here? Would somebody, uh, what would you do? Let's just see. What, what would the panels, panel do at this stage? Post-op day four. Zydel was the Zen there. sticking out of the conch or there was just a Zydel? No, just a Zydel. It was like right at the tip of the Zen, like maybe a millimeter away from the tip. I think you need to close the leak somehow. Um, conservatively if possible, but I think the leak is causing a problem and things will start becoming quite fibrotic quickly, I think, if you have a non-functioning blood. Yeah, good point. Is there a thought about the mechanism of the leak that as you were needling, you kind of stretched and tore the, the conge right over the Zen tip? Or is that an entry point for your needle? No, it's, it's where I, it's my needle, the, the tip of my needle when I was trying to needle the, the punctured, the punctured yeah. fruit, fruit, exactly. So there was a communication between tenon, like the sub tenon space through tenons, and then um, you know, if, if there's if that's the site of the tip of the Zen um, where the aqueous is leaking, and you've slowed down the uh, steroids, you've taken off the NSAIDs. I mean, this is just even if it closes, it's just a recipe for uh, for blood failure. So I, I would say that uh, we need to get on that uh, ASAP and find a way to close it and redirect the Zen. Okay, so I, I tried suturing. Actually, I, I forgot to write this here, but I, I tried suturing day one, first needle, the first suture. It kept leaking. I did another suture, this time a mattress suture. I tried to bunch up all the clones, try to get it like, you know, all closed around it. And it still failed and it's leaking again. So we have these large BCL contact lenses, the contour lenses, the 24 millimeters. So they're quite large and they can fit over those areas. I was like, wow, this is fantastic. This is clearly going to work. Let's wait on this a few weeks. Um, and I waited on it till 26 days and still pressure was four to six. It was starting to get mildly avascular, which isn't great. Uh, and it's killed, it still kept leaking. So that's when I decided uh, this is enough, we're going to the OR. So this is the surgery. Now I want you to, I can't, uh, can't show this to everybody. If you can go to YouTube, we can maybe try to show this live, the video, um, but it, it may be choppy for everyone. So if you can open up your YouTube and uh, go to my um, YouTube channel, I have a single video because I did this for this uh, exact purpose. If you can click on this link, you'll be able to follow as I narrate through. Now you can turn off my voice on the, on the narrated version of the, on YouTube if you like. But That's uh, a good I'll idea, George. I wonder if you can post, cut and paste that onto the chat box, but people can actually then um, actually just click on their chat. It's a good idea. Yeah, I, I, I can't access the chat box here with my uh, share screen oh, okay. here. Um, maybe can you play it on your, can you just play it on your, through your PowerPoint? Yeah, let me, let me just start it here. Play through okay. that, through that, there we go, yeah. We can see it pretty well, right. that's good. Okay, so we're seeing here, this is the Zen. So there's a couple of uh, suture passes that I used with the, and you see that nice little area of Seidel, really at the tip of the Zen. 
So I decided to do a, a radial incision here, uh, going um, around uh, three uh, and nine o'clock here is where tenons are thinnest. So this is a good spot to start and to go under tenons layer. Uh, so this is a different, different revision than a revision for a fibrotic bleb. So like a fibrotic bleb, it's different because tenons is going gonna, is gonna to be really um, thick and adherent and, and full of fibroblasts. And uh, here we're going to try to, you know, kind of use tenons to help us close this, this little uh, area of, um, of uh, bleb leak, basically. And here we see Zen. I was fortunate enough not to cut it because this is quite easy to cut when you're, when you're dissecting it off here. And I was trying to use some, some uh, Vanna scissors to try to remove that tenons that was right around it. And you see it's really like encompassed all around the Zen. And I used, so then I used these... Uh, tying forceps and I basically just pulled a little bit and I was able to fortunately just you know pluck it out and whoop there goes the zen it's out and um, at this stage I want to try to redirect its flow so it was a little bit too nasal so I used this loose suture that was kind of aimed around noon now you're going to say uh, why did you put some mitomycin here well honestly I was afraid that this was going to fail after doing all this manipulation all this uh, cautery so I used a small dose of 0.2 uh, milligrams per cc for one minute uh, we can see that the zen is nice nice and free and mobile uh, we sutured uh, conge down you saw even that area of avascularity so like that mitomycin I really wanted to put it as far away as I could from that um, that area of avascularity. And that's why I thought that a sponge would be good to direct the, the, the flow of mitomycin uh, in one specific area. We put one mattress suture over the, the radial incision and then a single uh, interrupted suture over that, um, that little tear that we had. And then when we look with the Seidel test, it looks all good, no, no leaks. We have a nice bleb that's starting to form. The Zen is right over TM, about a millimeter in the AC. And it's nice and straight. So I was pretty happy with the, the post-operative result. Uh, pressure day one was nine, side down negative with a diffuse bleb. And this is uh, her yesterday uh, with the pressure of 11, um, with a nice bleb. Not too ischemic so far, uh, but you know she's going to be high risk uh, later on. So I'll, I'll be monitoring her quite closely to make sure that everything is uh, Gonna, gonna go well for her, but uh, this is a, a good early postoperative result. George, what did you do with the tenons? I missed that. Did you just leave it or did you bring it over and incorporate it? Yeah, that's a good point. I left it. Now, um, I was, I, 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 oh, sorry, I, I, I pulled it over. The thing is the tenons and conge was kind of like all stuck together. It was already really like fibrotic. I, I was trying to, to dissect it and, and it wasn't coming. So I decided, you know, let's just, uh, leave it there. I'll, it'll, it'll also serve to uh, protect the uh, the Zen from eroding or or from going sidel again. So I decided to leave it there, and that's also a reason why I added the mitomycin, which was under tenons this time. So um, these are kind of uh, these was kind of my thought process at that time to avoid it from uh, from causing any uh, you know leaks in the future. George, I'm I'm going to actually go to our one of our attendees. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, Ahad maybe if you could maybe make a couple of comments. Uh, Ahad, sure. uh, Mahuchi has uh, had some experience with Zen. Um, go ahead, Ahad. Yeah, I, I, I like the, uh, the approach that, that was taken there. But uh, another one that I've been in that situation twice before. And one I tried exactly like that. And, that, and another one um, I found easier to do uh, was to just do an ab externo uh, approach. And I had... Uh, just use another Zen. I turned them, turned the eye down, uh, marked seven millimeters back. And I typically like to, uh, I found my success rate went way up once I started soaking the Zen before I put it in. It, it uh, soak it for about 40 seconds of BSS. But often you can make a little snip incision way far back and retrieve the original Zen. Um, and so if the pressure needs to really be low, not in this case, but in another case, you can actually reuse the second Zen, reload the injector and, and put it right in. Um, so just another way to, to attack the problem. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for your, your input. Uh, okay, we're, we're going to probably move forward. But I, I, George, you've opened up a lot of discussion about water drinking test. And I'm going to encourage those, of course, to, uh, to go uh, and maybe look it up. I mean, and there is certainly a need for more data, like a lot of things we do in glaucoma, which is 
still evolving. Uh, one question that came up though, in terms of if the patient's progressing already and you're gonna need to do surgery, you wanna do surgery anyways, why, why do a water drinking test? Why, why not just say, okay, I need to do surgery, I'm gonna do surgery. How does it help you in terms of selecting, selecting your surgery? Yeah, so it all depends on how low the pressure needs to go. So if you need it to go really low, then you're probably going to go for a trabeculectomy. Um, and if you're uh, if you can you know tolerate mid to low teens, then uh, a Zen can uh, can likely give you that. So that's where I wanted to uh, that's where I wanted to kind of differentiate between uh, doing a Zen or doing a, a trab. I think so my that's comment what, about doing the testing yeah. is you're documenting the need for the surgery. So if you have a complication that's site-threatening, you have evidence on your chart that there was a reason why you proceeded. Yeah, yeah and I think, I think that, uh, as you kind of said, George, I mean, I think does the patient need a pressure of 8 or do they need a pressure of 13, 24 hours a day, or at least consistently for any sort of insult or, or uh, fluctuation or, provoc or provocation? So I think that's where, that's where I think it can differentiate and pick which way you go, obviously going for a pressure of eight for a trab is, is not without uh, its own risks and it's not always easy to get. Uh, on the other hand, you know, putting a subconj mix procedure and getting consistently down to 12, 13 may be enough. Even though the patient's pressure in the office is the same, we would think that their ability to handle a pressure load or provo provocation or, or diurnal may help. And some of the, some of the um, attendees have asked, would you consider doing a water drinking test after? And that's exactly the point. We have a lot of data, actually, I think George probably knows this as well, uh, collecting data on WDT before and after surgery, progression before and after surgery, even though office pressures are the same. Uh, and so that, I think, gives us some, some stimulation for that. Obviously, it's, a, it's an art, and uh, you share some good uh, information. So thank you, George. Uh, thank you, Cin Cindy, uh, for your comments as well. Hattie as well, Nir. And uh, we're going to move in uh, to our next presenter, who is Jeb Ong. And I know that it's, uh, it's getting a bit later, but hey, if you're willing to stay on, we'll stay on, we'll keep on going. And uh, great uh, comments from the, uh, from the chat group. Uh, it's worked out really nicely. So we may have to have someone just monitoring the chat group just to be able to moderate that part alone. Uh, so keep them coming. And by the way, when you're, when you're giving us feedback, talk about maybe other topics you may wanna hear about. This has been a great forum for that. This is our biggest group we've had, so it's a bit hard to control. Um, so Jeb, uh, thank you for, uh, for presenting this next talk. I think, I think everyone's going to find this one. I can, I, you want to stay for, you want to stay for this one. I'll tell you why. Cause I can assure you, most of you are not familiar with what, how this case can be handled. And it's going to be a pearl, a real pro tip, I'll call it, uh, in your practice that maybe even avoid you needing to having to go surgery. Um, so go ahead, Jeb. Yeah, I completely agree. So uh, we have quite a lot to cover here and I know it's getting late, so I'm going to go, um, I'm going to get started right away. Um, I'm going to talk about this young gentleman. Uh, give me a second. Why is this not moving? So he's a 59 year old Caucasian male, essentially referred to us for a sublux intraocular lens in the right eye. Uh, in terms of past medical history, he's known for high blood pressure. His story is essentially a week ago, he fell and he suddenly noticed a change in his vision in that right eye only. So on exam, his best corrected visual acuity in the right eye was 2080, in the left it was 2020. In terms of his pressure, his right eye was 18 on zero classes and his left was 12. His conjunctiva and cornea were essentially unremarkable. And in his anterior chamber, he definitely had about one plus cells in the right eye, whereas in the left it was deep and quiet. His iris, he did have some peripupillary uh, transillumination defects, whereas in the left eye, there was none. And on gonioscopy, essentially what we're seeing is that his angles were open, despite the fact that there was a little bit of PAS inferiorly, but he also had quite a big reflector network, about three plus in that eye. And in the left, wide open angles, but only about one plus, which is something that we expect more in somebody of this age and who's only had one surgery in the past. In terms of his intraocular lens, I'm going to show you a picture afterwards, but essentially he had this one piece PCIOL that was partially subluxed um, in the anterior chamber, and the superior haptic was kind of encroaching at the angle. In terms of the capsular status, there was a small area of anterior capsule that we could see. It was kind of rolled up though, and the posterior capsule really wasn't visible. The thought here was that it probably was no longer present. The left eye, the lens was perfectly centered. It looked good. And in terms of his discs, just to mention, his cup to disc was about 0.3, no thinning, no notching, get healthy rims in both eyes. So this is the slit lamp photo here. So as you can see, 
he has this uh, intraocular lens that's partially subluxed into the anterior chamber. On the right, you can see on retroillumination, the uh, pericrepillary transillumination defects that I had mentioned. Uh, this is his ECC, looking at his cell density on the left is actually the right eye, on the right is the uh, left eye. But that cell density of 1,661, that's, you know, that's, that's okay. It's definitely low for somebody in his age. He also has evidence of gute there. And in the left eye, you could almost argue also that 2004 is very low for somebody in his age. In terms of his biometry, let's just quickly show you here, his axial length is pretty average at about 24 millimeters. His ACD, well, he does have that intraocular lens that's pretty sublux in the anterior chamber. And his cornea, he has some astigmatism, but overall, again, nothing that's very remarkable. I don't have topography, unfortunately. I don't have any preoperative anterior segment OCT or UBM, but I do have some postoperatively, which I think will be quite interesting for everybody. His MAC OCT, there's no evidence of macular edema. I'm only showing the right eye here. So I want to kind of open this up to the panel and just kind of see what management options are you thinking here? Like what type of surgery would you observe or are you definitely going to do something? And if you will, what are you going to do? Let's start with Seb. So, uh, sorry, uh, Jeb, can you go back to your uh, picture slide of the, of the IOL? And then I forgot to introduce yeah. Seb Gagne no uh, from Montreal, who's joining, uh, joined us, who's finished, uh, I guess, uh, seen some patients, and Josh Teitman, who's uh, sponsored by, again, by Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> who uh, who joined us as well? Who's a cornea cornea dude uh, at uh, Trillium University of Toronto in prison? Okay, so let's go ahead, Sebastian. So, uh, well, well, the the first thing, uh, uh, this is is this a dilated uh, or uh, this is undilated? Or? This picture it's undilated. So, so, so the first thing we see is the uh, the haptic uh, that's in the anterior chamber. Uh, we see that uh, it's a one-piece uh, PCIOL that's supposed to be uh, usually located in the capsular bag. And obviously, there's one part of it that's not in the capsular bag. So my first question is, uh, what is the, uh, the, the, the rest of the, uh, the IOL? Is it, is it uh, in, the, in the capsule inferiorly or it's, uh, it's the whole uh, IOL that uh, sits in the sulcus? That's the first thing. And I'd like to see uh, what kind of uh, residual uh, capsule there is. Uh, uh, behind the IOL, if I can uh, understand why the, uh, the, the IOL is in this position. Is there a zonalysis? Is there a, a rent? Uh, is there uh, any uh, other issues uh, be, behind the iris uh, or and behind the, I, the, the IOL? So, uh, okay, so those are great questions. Essentially, what I can tell you in terms of zonular status, um, there was no history of complicated surgery in the left eye from what we can see there was no pseudophacodonesis. I know it's not necessarily an indication that the right eye might be doing well, but it is something that can help you out. In terms of the capsular status, so what I was saying is that the posterior capsule we could not visualize on dilated exam, so we didn't have pictures of post dilation, but the only part we could see was the anterior capsule kind of superior nasally and it looked like it was kind of rolled up. Um, so the rest of the capsule we really couldn't visualize very well. There really wasn't much that we were seeing there. So there, well, <laughs> if there's no complex, uh, complicated surgery, maybe that's from the enter uh, the, 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 the chart, but uh, you can always ask the patient, how long was your surgery for? Because usually those, uh, those that show up like this, they tell me, they tell me well, this, uh, this eye was probably a bit longer. So you can, uh, you can usually uh, deduce by this, uh, that the, there was some, some kind of complication. Now uh, you need to, uh, to uh, sort of uh, see what kind of complication, uh, likely from what you're seeing that the rolled up capsule, there was probably a zonular weakness and the, uh, how long the surgery was uh, uh, long ago, uh, this come, uh, the, the, the zonules uh, that have fibrosed and the rest of the capsule that fibrosed maybe uh, uh, has aggravated the, uh, the zonular complex or zon zonular fragility. So uh, uh, are we gonna be able to work with the, well, whatever remaining capsule there is uh, in for what you're describing uh, uh, my guess is that no there, there's probably no uh, no good capsular bag or or zonules we can work with so this is going to be uh, to take into account when we're, we're going to want to uh, sort of salvage this this IOL yeah so I mean again these are great points and unfortunately I don't have further details um, in his history he certainly didn't mention anything about you know in terms of duration of surgery but there are some people who just you know, aren't as aware as certain patients, I suppose. Um, but from our point of view as well, we kind of looked at this as a capital status was definitely not something we could really work with. Uh, anybody else has other comments in the panel here in terms of what you think you might want to do? And so Jeb, there was a question from the group here. There's no vitreous present that's visible in the anterior chamber. 
No, from on, on the exam, there was no vitreous that was visible in the interior. And tube. the eye well is not in the bag or is in the bag? So there wasn't any really visual, there wasn't any bag to really visualize except it's very nasally. And as you can see, this lens is prolapsed. In the so, jo so Josh, what are you going to do, man? You got, you got this eye well that was probably in the sulcus placed and uh, probably had some maybe complex surgery and ended up now partly in the AC. What are you going to do here? It's not in the bag, apparently, so... Yeah, I have to agree with um, with Seb right off the bat that you know having taken a number of these, this looks like a looks like an SA lens, right? Those can be tricky to take out of a bag with a, a Sommerings ring because of the terminal bulbs. There, there's no way it showed up in the AC if it was in a bag. I'd have to say. Mm -hmm. um, so now that we've got it in this situation, yeah, like you said, the first thing is there's probably no bag, and this is a single piece acrylic lens, so this has to come out of the eye. Um, so you know you're going to do an IOL exchange and uh, you have a number of options. I, I, you know, I have the advantage of seeing this case, but I also have a, a very strong preference as to how I would place my secondary IOL here, just having done it for some time. So I would be very strongly considering a secondary IOL and it would be a Yamane or intrascleral haptic fixation, double flange technique. Thank you, Josh. Uh, I think you probably want to go start working out now. You got your uh, gym back there. So go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so for the sake of time, let's uh, move along here. And I'm gonna show you, again, there's the link. I'm gonna post this in the chat just in case you wanna also visualize it at the same time. Or actually, I'm gonna put it in the Q&A. Uh, sorry. Actually, you know what, let's do it in the chat here. So I'm gonna paste it in the chat. If you wanna access that, you can, but at the same time, I'm gonna be narrating this. So similar to with George, just maybe mute it if you're gonna watch it at the same time. Otherwise, I'll be narrating at the same time as well, okay? So this is the case, just a quick edit. As you can see here, we're using the viscoat uh, cannula to actually prolapse this lens uh, superior, back in the interior chamber while injecting. And we're using a Kuglin hook to basically take out the, the remaining haptic and bring it into the interior chamber as well. Following that, we do cut the lens in half so that we're able to explant both halves easily through that temporal coil incision. We do a, it's, we do a parse plan of vitrectomy here, making sure, especially we're gonna be placing the haptics, um, making sure that we got a nice cleanup we're using a caliper to ensure that we're 180 degrees apart, again, for proper centration of your lens. Here we're marking two millimeters from the limbus and perpendicular to that, another two millimeters. That's gonna be the scalp tunnel. Here we're using a Zeiss CT Lucia. So as you can imagine, this is a Yamani technique we're doing. It's a 30 gauge needle, TSK thin wall that we're placing in that uh, scleral tunnel and into the, into the, um, the eye here. We're using micro tires to essentially thread this haptic into that needle and we're gonna bring it out then we cauterize the tip, essentially creating a bulb that prevents it from sliding back into the posterior chamber. And by doing that, um, you're just protecting yourself from, from that haptic sliding in. You wanna make sure there's no risk of erosion, so you wanna make sure you push it back in the scleral tunnel. We're doing the same thing for the second haptic, and you can see we're starting to get a pretty nice centration of that lens here. So it's pretty much as Josh was mentioning, we also thought that probably intrascleral haptic fixation, secondary IOL was gonna be the best uh, move here, okay? so. Post-operatively, this patient was doing quite well. And essentially at post-op week six, the vision got to 2040 from 2080. Uh, there was a temporal cross stitch that we put at the end in the temporal pericorneal incision, which was leading to some against the rule astigmatism. And so we removed it at that visit. Um, but we were noticing that there was quite a bit of iridodenesis, but the lens was well-centered and it was pretty stable. Okay, so on some that exam, essentially it looked the way it did at the end of our case, but that same visit, we actually took some imaging and this is what we saw. So what you're seeing here is that that intraocular lens is actually prolapsed into the anterior chamber again, and that iris is kind of uh, folding behind it. And what's very interesting is even on anterior segment OCT, we're seeing the same thing, right? So this one on the left is a horizontal section. The one on the right is a vertical section. And you can see how you don't really visualize the, uh, the lens here, but you can see how that iris is really folded up underneath it. Now, I even have UBM that's showing a similar thing. You can really see where the, the IOL is here. And you can see, again, the top section, the bottom is a horizontal section. There's a bit of tilt on that lens, really not that bad, uh, but you can definitely see that that, lens, that iris is going behind it. And one thing I want you to also look at is there's a bit of an iris bowing, a posterior bowing of that iris. Um, it's not as evident as in some cases that, you know, the literature has shown as well, but um, I, do, I do think that there's some also that's occurring here. Um, so actually, before I get to that, so uh, just to ask maybe uh, Seb, Joshua, have you kind of seen these before? And you know, what are some of the options that you think about in terms of how to address this? 
Uh, in my practice, no, uh, no, I haven't seen this uh, using the, the, the Yamani technique, but uh, I know it's been reported. Uh, some of the hypothesis uh, why this happens is maybe that you have asymmetrical uh, passage. So if you're, you're not really uh, 180 degree uh, from limbus to limbus for your insertion, and if the length also of your insertion is not symmetrical, then that may end up to some, some kind of tilt or asymmetry. Uh, usually during the, uh, the surgery, we can compensate for small uh, level of asymmetry by uh, melting a bit more aptic on one side than the other and, to, mm -hmm. and, and playing around to recenter the whole thing. But that's uh, definitely something that can happen. The other thing is that uh, the, depending on the anterior chamber depth, you know, so you have some, some eyes that are small and some eyes that are uh, a bit larger. So if you have larger eye, baby, there's more, uh, there's more yield for, for this uh, to occur. Uh, I would say probably a high, uh, a longer actual length or high myope is probably at risk. And you have to uh, take into consideration also the, uh, the pupil size. Uh, this uh, can happen if, uh, if patients have a large pupil size and uh, at night they dilate more than the optic, si uh, the optic size. And then uh, later on, uh, when they, they constrict, they, they, there's an optic capture of the, uh, of the iris over the uh, one, one part of the IOL. So that's uh, something that uh, can happen. In the worst case, it can even lead to, to a, a pupillary block. So uh, this is uh, something to, uh, to look for. Now the easy fix, uh, first, uh, if, uh, if I would have seen a patient like this, I would uh, probably just pop it back at the slit lamp. But if it's a recurring pro problem, then I would uh, strongly consider uh, either uh, trying medical uh, treatment, topical, either with the pilocarpine, if they don't, don't have any uh, risk for null detachment and if they're not symptomatic. But uh, I think in the long run, if, if this uh, would keep uh, going, uh, coming, happening, I would uh, consider doing uh, blocking sutures. So basically in the posterior chamber, uh, going from limbus to limbus, uh, suturing a proline mm -hmm. uh, over and under the IOL so that it, it creates like a, a net in, in between the optics so that it doesn't uh, uh, it, it, prevent, it, it reduces the tilt and may prevent uh, any uh, other uh, optic capture in the future. I've seen okay. someone actually do a pupilplasty on this and the patient, of course, wound up getting UGG syndrome and had to have an IOL exchange in a glaucoma procedure, so probably not the best idea. I'm going to just add, um, so Seb, Seb did hit a lot of the main points, but one that was never mentioned was a PI. So I think it's mandatory to do a PI in any Yamane case. And then the second thing is when you're doing your PI, it should be large. And if it's not large, you should have two in different areas. So there's some people like Steve Safran who will strongly advocate for two PIs in every Yamane case as well. So that's just something that should be there. Great. So you're absolutely right. I think we've hit a lot of points uh, right in the head. I almost feel like I don't need to continue the rest of this presentation, but regardless, I will. And so this is essentially what we're talking about here is pupillary optic capture. Interestingly enough, this is probably one of the most common uh, complications following transscleral or scleral fixated IOLs. Um, in the literature, it's been reported to occur 8 to 14%. And if you consider intermittent optic capture, this can actually go up to 30% even. Now, some of the potential vision-threatening complications, Seb kind of mentioned a few, but chronic uveitis with deposits on the lens and essentially blurring your patient's vision, causing positive dysphotopsias. Uh, it can also lead to UGH syndrome, so uveitis, glaucoma, hyphema. IOL tilt, decentration. Some even think it might lead to further subluxation, dislocation. I'll explain to you why afterwards. And macular edema. In terms of risk factors that have been kind of mentioned in the literature, again, Seb has kind of mentioned quite a few actually but floppy iris syndrome is potentially one of the issues. In terms of pupil size, there are some kind of papers that talk about maybe it's a, it's a, there's an association, but then others kind of say that maybe not so much. So I think that one's maybe still a little bit controversial. Asymmetric eye well fixation, the thought there is if you're decentered or if your lens is tilted, you can imagine how that iris might more easily go behind it and, um, and stay in that position. Reverse pupil block, whether that's intraoperative, preoperative, or postoperative, that's been mentioned also in the literature. Patients who have uh, vitrectomies, the thought there is that there's less um, stability of the lens because there's no longer that support, either from zonules, capsule, or the vitreous itself. And also there probably is more um, anterior posterior movement of the iris itself. In terms of anterior chamber depth, so it's been kind of reported as well that larger preoperative ACD 
Um, here, what might be occurring is that the pupil margin actually sits more posterior in relation to the limbus as opposed to a patient who has a smaller ACD. And that's important because a lot of times when we're placing our scleral groove or we're, we're deciding where we're going to place our scleral sutures, we're basing that on the limbus a little bit more on that in the next couple of slides, actually. And so there's actually some people who propose that maybe in patients who have a larger anterior chamber depth, that maybe you should be opting more for a parse plane of positioning of your lens and not so much secondary sulcus, which I would argue is what the majority of surgeons are probably doing. So this is an interesting study here. It's a retrospective chart review. It looks at 94 eyes that underwent transcleral fixation of a three-piece acrylic IOL. Uh, 38 of these were sutured in the uh, ciliary sulcus plane and 56 were parse plana. Essentially what that means is that they were going either 1.5 millimeters from the posterior limbus or three millimeters if they're going for parse plana. And just to kind of briefly talk about this whole ciliary sulcus versus parse plana. So part of the pros with ciliary sulcus placement is essentially surrounding structures offer stable fixation. You're also avoiding the major arterial circle of the iris, ciliary processes, and trabecular meshwork. Um, but some of the cons is possibly there is an increased risk of pupillary optic capture and essentially leading to things like UG syndrome as well. So just a bit of a refresher for us in terms of where the major circle of the iris is in relation to ciliary sulcus, iris, ciliary body, and pars plana. Now, when you're looking at pars plana haptic placement, some of the pros, well, as I mentioned, it's essentially the reverse of with ciliary sulcus, so less risk of pupillary optic capture and subsequently less risk of UJ syndrome. Some of the cons, I would argue, a lot of anterior segment surgeons might not feel as comfortable going that far back, especially in smaller eyes and there's theoretically an increased uh, risk of renal tears around attachment. So I wanna kind of look through, just to kind of briefly mention some of the, the landmarks that we typically think about when we're doing these surgeries. Uh, this is on Ike's YouTube channel, Scleral Spur Positioning for Suture Fixation. What he's essentially demonstrating with the diamond uh, knife here is the termination of the blue zone, which again, if you go through the literature, I, I would say that there's a bit of lack of clarity in terms of how people are defining um, what structures are, are underneath that in the anterior chamber. Our group typically thinks of it as essentially the, the beginning or the anterior part of the scleral spur. You have to remember scleral spur isn't exactly a, a sharp delineated line, it's more of a band. Um, and I think what's most important is essentially we're going about 1.5 millimeters behind that. That's where he's created the scleral groove here with the diamond knife again. And essentially by doing that, we'll be in the ciliary sulcus space when we're uh, suturing our lens. So again, this is a histopathology slide here, kind of showing the same thing. That uh, red line is showing the, the, the transition from cornea to sclera, and the little marks of red is essentially showing where the scleral spur is. Again, trying to show the relationship in terms of where you'll be entering when you make that incision. This is from that previous study I was mentioning. So the left uh, image here is showing ciliary sulcus placement of that lens. You can see the reverse bowing of that iris and how the iris is opposed on that lens. On the right, this is pars plana positioning. You can see there's a big space in between the lens and the iris. You could argue this lens doesn't look particularly well centered. I'm not sure why they use this image, to be honest with you, but regardless, I think for our purposes, it does show um, what I'm trying to demonstrate here. So at the end- Jeff, sorry. I, Oh, sorry, you're gonna just, I was gonna say that th those were done by uh, suture fixation, correct? That's right, exactly, suture fixation, yeah. So I guess, I guess the one point, and maybe Josh may talk about this, maybe for some comments, but the farther back you go, of course, the more, the haptics are going to be stretched. So any, any thoughts on that as far as consideration for the distance from, the, from whatever the landmark is, and we can debate, just want to make sure that we make it clear that most advice, including Imani, are from the uh, visual limbus, right? The anterior pathologist limbus, which is basically the cons insertion to the cornea. And the Yamani's approach is two millimeters back. We're talking maybe that isn't the best place to look at. Maybe we make another another landmark looking at more of the posterior limbus or, or where the blue zone ends, so to speak, in that white area of the sclera. Um, but the farther back you go, you get more stretch of the uh, of your haptic. So what do you, how do you feel about this, you know, going farther back like this with the Yamani technique? This is not Yamani here, of course. Yeah, so I think um, the, yeah, there's a few things you mentioned. So the first is, you know, that um, that video that you were showing, Jeb, uh, of Ike looking for the blue zone, looking for the scleral spur is great. But remember, the whole point of this is not having to do a pyridomy. So you lose that, that landmark, right? So you do have to use another landmark. So I think one of the key things is when you look at the, the limbus, the surgical limbus, 
the conge grows over the cornea. So I think what I always do is I really look in the eye and look at the iris and you can see how much po more posterior the iris plane really is than say the anterior limbus or posterior limbus. So I really look at the iris as an idea of where I'm going, but I do measure to about two millimeters, but I measure two millimeters posterior to what I think truly is the limbus, which is not where the blood vessels are or where you're starting to, to lose them. And, and that, remember, of course, it changes too. If you put your, uh, at your haptics at 12 and six or at three and nine. Um, the second thing is, yeah, this is not a great technique for high myopes or eyes that have a huge white to white um, because you do start to pull on those haptics and you do have more than enough haptic to get across most eyes. But the more you pull on it, the more you're likely to get tilt because um, you're kind of getting some force onto that onto that uh, IOL. So I think that um, the key is really to uh, pick a spot that you're comfortable is the actual limbus. Look at through the cornea to where the iris is and you should be posterior to it. Um, but the last thing is I don't think you need to be super far back. You really don't. You need to, you should be in a relatively physiologic plane. Um, that's going to give you the right IOL calculation because these you're calculating. I mean, you can obviously uh, change your IOL calculations, but I calculate my IOL to be just sort of what I would call the posterior end of the sulcus almost. That's where I want to be. I don't want to be in the pars plana. I don't think the lens needs to be that far back at all. Um, and, uh, so those are just my, my, uh, my thoughts on this. And I would also say that here, the picture where the IOL is posterior to the iris, it's not that far back from the iris. That's like, what do you say? Assuming an ACD of 3.5, that you're like one millimeter back. That's yeah, not, yeah. You know, but, but that's quite far back. Even the cornea thick, thickness, you, you're probably only uh, less than uh, five, 500, 700 microns back. That, that's, that's sort of what I'm saying. That's not super far back. I don't think we need to be super far back. Um, but then the, the last thing is, you know, when you're measuring, even if you know where you're measuring from, let's say you really do cut down to, to see your scleral spur, um, the angle that you enter the eye, if you angle parallel versus perpendicular or even posterior, you're going to end up in a huge difference, like, like one, one millimeter, two millimeter difference, depending on the angle of insertion. And that's another point. Uh, yeah, that, that's a really good. Point. That's a really good point, Josh. I'm glad you mentioned that because if you enter perpendicular to the scleral surface as opposed to, let's say, iris plane, uh, tangential, it's going to be very different where you enter the eye. So I think that's uh, that's really key. Um, and I, I I don't know if I agree with you, Josh, as far as not being able to see the end of the blue zone. If you if you massage and milk the conjunctiva with a with a cannula and, and kind of just really kind of smoothen it out and and blanch the vessels, you can still see. Uh, a pretty good blue zone. And, and there's some correlation to axial length and to refractive error in terms of how far back to go. But the point in general is, of course, be mindful that not every eye is going to be two millimeters back and be particularly concerned about the patient who has a very deep AC. And I think the iris is a good, good, good landmark of that as well, as you said. So thank you. Hey, great. I think we've kind of uh, gone around here, but um, essentially from that previous article, again, what they were showing is that whether you do pars plana or you do uh, ciliary sulcus placement, there wasn't really an in a change, a difference in the risk of uh, renal detachment, IOL decentration, or tilt, uh, macular edema, secondary glaucoma, or vitreous hemorrhage. And what they saw with the ciliary sulcus placement is that there definitely was a higher risk of pupillary optic capture and potentially higher risk of IOL dislocation subsequently. Uh, the thought there was just the recurrent stress and, and pressure on tensile structures. Again, the iris doesn't really confirm much in terms of tension, but just repeated kind of uh, pupillary optic capture like that can lead to uh, this uh, loosening and affecting the, uh, the structures. The other thing that they mentioned is that if you over tighten and you're in ciliary sulcus, you probably will be bringing your lens up a bit more anterior than you initially expected. And that probably increases the risk again, even more of pupillary optic capture. So just to bring back to another uh, case series here that was published by our group not too long ago, actually. And essentially, this one was looking at the clinical resolution of UGH following laser peripheral iridotomy. Uh, this was looking at six patients with sulcus place uh, uh, posterior chamber eye wells who developed reverse pupillary block. So two of those patients was scleral suture. Uh, one was a, a Yamani or an intrascleral fixated, um, intrascleral haptic fixated lens. And three of them were the more conventional uh, way that we typically describe sulcus. So here, I just want to show you the dem demographics a little bit, but also the clinical presentation. All of these patients essentially had transillumination defects, had evidence of PDS, the concave iris bowing that I was mentioning earlier. Five of them had elevated IOPs and required medications. Following LPI, all of these actually resolved, but their pressures definitely got better. The configuration of the iris was a lot more physiologic afterwards. 
um, but essentially LPI can successfully treat reverse pupillary block and in turn address UGH that can occur following that. So some of the treatment options, again, we've kind of gone through quite a bit actually, which is great kind of getting the uh, opinion from all these experts here. But as we mentioned, pilocarpine is something that you can opt for. You know, when you kind of look at the literature, depending on what you read, success rates can be about 30%. And you can argue that there could be issues with patient compliance from brow A, uh, increased risk of things like inflammation, renal tear, renal detachment potentially. LPI has been reported to be anywhere from 50 to 60% successful, and it's minimally invasive, usually very well tolerated by your patients. Some advocate for further surgery, some even propose more uh, repeat IO repositioning. I don't know because looking at the success rates, it's been about 40% when I'm reading about it. And, you know, to put your patient at risk again of surgery, I don't know that that's really warranted in my opinion. Some kind of mentioned intraoperative or postoperative surgical iridectomy, which I think JT kind of mentioned as well. And so interestingly, I actually went back to our case and this is the end uh, of the procedure here. And so this is, there's something that's been reported it's called the pushback test. And essentially what it is, is what I'm gonna show you here. So at the end of the case here, as we're hydrating our corneal incisions with a 27 gauge cannula, I want you to pay attention to what happens to the iris you see how it actually goes into a reverse pupillary block uh, configuration. And so there are people who believe that if you have a positive pushback test, it could be an indication that you might as well go in there with your protractor and uh, create a surgical iridectomy right away, which, you know, in retrospect, it's interesting that maybe that, that is something that we should consider at that time. Uh, so that's kind of why I, was, I thought this was a very interesting case to bring about because I think a lot of people perhaps don't know about this. Uh, to talk about what uh, Nir actually touched on already is that pupiloplasty is another thing that's been mentioned. In terms of success rate, I've kind of read about 50%. So again, you can argue putting your patient at risk of surgery for 50% when you have LPI that could potentially um, be the first step. I, I think I agree with Josh as in LPI probably should be the first step in management. And maybe that's something that you should do routinely in your uh, in cases of intrascale haptic fixated lenses. So what did we do with our patients? So, Again, this is why, you know, Seb actually mentioned this as well. So what we did, uh, we brought this patient back at post-op month three, because at that post-op month, uh, post-op week six visit, as I mentioned, on slit lamp, this patient didn't present with what we saw in imaging. So at post-op month three, though, we did see this uh, pupillary optic capture. So we went ahead with a 30 gauge needle and we did an IOL pushback at the slit lamp, following which we instilled pilocarpine and then we did LPI. Now this patient was, you know, basically the perfect patient because he was actually looking in the mirror and he was noticing it occurring. So when we brought him back about a month and a half after, he was actually saying, no, it's never happened again since we did that procedure. So it was great feedback to kind of close the loop and to kind of see um, essentially if our treatment was effective. And that being said, I haven't seen this patient since that time, but it was still nice to kind of see that afterwards, he certainly wasn't noticing it in the mirror. So that's essentially the case here today. Um, shameless plug, Instagram, JB Bang, follow me, thank you. Um, but yeah, open for discussions, comments, questions, uh, please. I think we've, uh, you know, we've opened it up to something quite uh, interesting here. Okay, thanks, thanks, uh, Jeb. Maybe I'll get Josh. I mean, there's been a couple of questions that have just been come up about, uh, um, you know, how how much cauter do you apply to the uh, haptics? Um, any other pearls as far as IOL calculations, things like that? I think you probably read some of these. Do you want to just address it? Sure. Yeah. So there were some comments. So um, for uh, IOL calculation, I use an A constant of about 118.2, and I uh, aim just a tiny bit myopic. If I'm doing it as a straight up procedure, I, I change that if I'm doing it combined with endothelial keratoplasty. Um, I, now that's where it works for me, and that's where I, like, you know, I know how far I measure back from the limbus. It may be different for everyone. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, someone asked about avoiding tilt, and I'm trying to send a file, but it's not really working. So I'll tell you the key to avoid, actually, um, well, I won't share my screen, but basically there's a few things. The key uh, is one being exactly 180 degrees apart. Um, so I actually use the toric marker to mark, um, and then you have to be the same distance back from the limbus. So I use approximately two millimeters. So you are exactly 180 apart, exactly the same distance from the limbus. Now your suture passes have to be the exact same length. If one is one millimeter and your other intrascleral pass is three millimeters, then your internal ostia are not 180 apart. So I, I actually do not measure two millimeters for that. I actually look, I do mine bevel up and I go in the length of the bevel, which is approximately one and a half. And I don't think you need a full two millimeter. I actually like a bit of a shorter one. And then the last thing is 
your trajectory, not only does it have to be the same length, but it has to be the same in the X, Y, and Z. So you have to go, you can't be aiming towards the limbus on one pass and away from the limbus on the other. It should be perpendicular or slightly posterior, but about five degrees uh, on both so that you have really two intrasclerial uh, passes that are the same in all three dimensions. And that's, uh, that's how you get no tilt. And uh, the key to having the same trajectory within the intrascleral is to have the same eye pressure. So you should, you, I don't know if you, you all noticed that once uh, Jeb did a pars plana vitrectomy there, he switched to pars plana infusion. So if you're not comfortable with pars plana infusion, you should have an anterior chamber maintainer for this case. This is not a case you do under just viscoelastic. You need a pressurized eye and you want it to be the same pressure when you make your intrascleral passes. So that's going to give you the same uh, trajectory in the sclera and that's what's going to minimize your tilt. Um, and lastly, for how much of the haptic to burn, not much. You don't need to burn much at all. Uh, in fact, the more you burn, the more uncertainty you have that your haptics are the same length. So it's just enough to have a little nub. You want it to, to be able to enter the sclera. And uh, don't worry about this thing going through. It's, it's very, very, very difficult to pull these things through the eye. Um, you're not ever going to do it. Um, so you do want a small nub. Um, and I think those are the, I think those are all the questions. I think you're on mute, Ike. I have a couple of requests uh, to uh, take off your hat. Uh, BMW <laughs> call. I think, I think really what we're really going to show each other is how we all look with Ike length hair after COVID is over. That's right. I've been trying to tell you that one. And unfortunately, you can't, you can't grow your beard too long for those N95 masks, but a goatee, goatee does work. Okay, well, um, that, that, was, that was a great discussion. I, you know, we are coming on about two hours here. We, already have, we still have about 270 people who, have still, who are still online, which is incredible. I'm just amazed at, uh, at the great conversation that some of you have been following as well. Um, so I want to thank again uh, all the speakers and the panelists for being here and being involved. We are going to continue this, so uh, we, will, we will spread the word. Uh, our next uh, session, Jeb, I believe is, uh, Jeb, unmute yourself. It's uh, Wednesday. Uh, at 3 o'clock, I want to say, Jeb? Wednesday at 3 p.m. and Friday at 9 a.m. next week. So we'll send out, we'll send out some, more, some more things. Uh, do, uh, you know, uh, provide some feedback. After you log off, you can email back and if you have some topics or, or cases you're interested in. We can also do some lectures as well, though we find cases usually are more interesting. Uh, and we also uh, will have the occasion to maybe review an important paper, a landmark paper or something interesting that, um, that's, uh, that may be out there. So... We thank you for that. Uh, everybody stay safe, uh, hang in there. We're always challenged with uh, you know, providing care to our patients, uh, even though we, uh, we are restricted with COVID and we're all finding our ways to try to you know, support uh, our patients and each other. This is one way, of course, to support each other. Um, and again, our thoughts and prayers are with those who are, who are sick uh, and whose family members are sick and relatives are sick. Uh, it's hard to see that. It's hard to see anybody be sick, but of course, those are our family and our friends and our colleagues is hard. And we certainly are at risk. So please take great, great precaution. I will send out uh, just some, um, some uh, links for the next sessions. Those of you who, are, who have been on board, I, we have your email address. We can email you that too. And this will be recorded as well. So we can post a recording uh, for those of you who want to watch it again. So thank you again. Uh, peace out to everybody. Uh, and enjoy your rest of your weekend. Uh, we will see you soon again. Thank you. God bless. Take care.